Okay. Well, hi there, everyone. Um, welcome to, to um, welcome to the fourth event of our year, um, a historical perspective on space history. Um, we have a guest speaker, Mr. Eric Vermet from the Oxford Observatory. And without further ado, here you to it. Thank you very much. <coughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. I had hoped that there were a little bit more people, but um, you guys are definitely interested. I take it. Um, I'm, I'm from the Oxford Observatory, which uh, is an, an area school in Oxford, and they, we have built our own observatory there. I used to be careful to saying that one, we are one of the few schools who have an observatory, but now I dare say that we are the only school in the country who has an observatory which is operational and which is operated by the school, by volunteers, but under auspices of the school. I'm delighted that um, the NZSSA, the New Zealand Student Space Association, has a branch here in Kreisjes now recently, and uh, that we work together. And I'm, I'm really excited about all the things we can do together, in, especially in terms of organizing events. And you guys are unstoppable in, in all the events that you're already uh, mushrooming, <laughs> really. Uh, fantastic. And really a pleasure to be here. Originally, we thought that um, we would show the Gagarin movie as on its own on the 12th of April. 12th of April is the uh, celebration of, it's now global, uh, Yuri's Day. Um, for logistical reasons, that didn't work. In hindsight, I think it's a, it, that was a really good thing because um, my suggestion was to broaden the scope and to include the, the NASA first mission in orbit. And then automatically, it was my feeling that uh, we should have some sort of a historical perspective around it, uh, how the space race started, etc. So that's really um, what I'm trying to, to do. I need to be really short because um, the Gagarin movie is 108 mo minutes and the other one 26 or something. So that adds up. That's the main body of what we're doing tonight. It's a movie night. Uh, but I really would like to talk about the history a bit. I'm not impressed with the lack of history teaching in secondary schools in New Zealand at all. I think you can get your university entrance credits without having one minute of history if you don't choose it. This is really, really a, a, a bad thing for any society in my personal view. When I was at high school, which is really long time ago, um, it was a six year school. Um, we started with history in the first year, and we had history every year. We started with the Egyptian pharaohs and then the classical Greek, and it all go, went well in what here is year 13. We were in the modern history. We did it all. Um, I hated it <laughs> because we had to learn these, these things by heart. You know, this year, that emperor, that war, generals. Uh, it was a very bad way of teaching, but... Uh, in, uh, later in my life, I have realized that it is extremely important to have a, a historic perspective of how humanity, if you want to be a global citizen now and take your responsibility and separate what they now call fake news from, from real stuff, you really need to have that background. So I'm, I'm really um, very uh, uh, critical about the fact that um, you young folk probably have had fairly little history in your um, high school education. And that's one more reason for me to, uh, uh, having living memory of those events, by the way, to um, talk a little bit about that history, history perspective. Now, it's, it's very easy to make this a political discussion, and I certainly don't want to. Um, it's fairly recent history still, and we are still in the, uh, the Russia-US situation. Um, I don't want to go into a political discussion, so what I'm doing is I'm calling the help of the aliens. <coughs> and this is a thought uh, process I'm suggesting. Uh, think that suggests that we have aliens watching us and have been watching us for quite some time. Um, that's one of the solutions of the Fermi paradox, as you know. <laughs> Where are they? Um, Suggest also that we communicate with them, which is, uh, in my view, zero percentage probability that we will ever be able to communicate with aliens, but let's leave that apart. Um, suggest that we uh, can talk to them, communicate, and they would tell us, In uh, you had this idea about time, and you called something in, 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 an, in a timeline, uh, 1961, and you succeeded in getting one of you 
going around your planet it was a major um, accomplishment. We congratulate you, fantastic. But then something like nine months later, the same thing happened again somewhere else. So what's, what's wrong with you guys? You know, that's the, the view <laughs> that the aliens could well um, present us with. And what, do we, what would we say? That's my question. Yeah, we had good guys and we had bad guys and there was all kinds of uh, stuff going on. And, uh, but now, today, we have a much better situation. Uh, it's all honky-dory now. Really? So that really is my perspective through this event tonight. Um, when I'm done, it's hopefully as briefly as possible to give you that historical perspective up to 1961. Um, we watch the movies and then I will come back and basically just trigger off a discussion and I hope that we will really have a good discussion about what you think, what the present day situation is regarding how we do space exploration. Uh, if you're happy with it, if you're not happy with it, how would you in your careers that are just down the, down the road uh, want to do space exploration? So that really is the red line I would like to uh, carry through. We have to start at the end of World War II. There was a uh, famous, you can also say notorious, uh, conference in Yalta between the three the, um, allies who had been fighting um, Nazi Germany. Uh, Joseph Stalin for the USSR, the, United, the, the Soviet Union. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt was the President of the United States. And Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister of the UK. Those were basically the three parties who had been fighting Nazi Germany in Europe. And uh, this was in, in early February 45, but it was inevitable that it would end the war very soon. It was just a matter of weeks, basically. The um, surrender of uh, Germany was in uh, May 45, just uh, three months later. Uh, what they intended to do at the conference is discuss the situation in Europe post-war. It was a mess. Uh, the whole Western Europe had been occupied for the whole year, for the whole uh, during the duration of the war. I lived in the Netherlands, one of those countries that had been occupied. I was four months or five months old when the Germans invaded my country. I uh, can't recall it, but it had definite in, in lasting influence on, on my life. Um, <coughs> So the, the only parties who really were in the game, if you call it that, were the, uh, those three allies. Um, I want to remind people of one um, fact which is not really very much discussed at all. And that is the fact that the Soviet Union suffered from the World War II at least one order of magnitude more than any other country. Uh, they were invaded in 1941 by Germany over a front line of thousands of kilometers. Um, that is the biggest land-based military operation ever until today. Uh, they had to fight that. The Germans were in the, uh, at the gates of Moscow at some point. And then they had to fight them gradually back. And in 45, where we are now, and I'll show you the map. Um, They had um, passed Berlin, and they were in the kind of in the middle of Germany. This was a map that was drawn in Yalta. There were various versions, but let's not talk about those details. This is the um, this is Germany. Uh, this is Berlin. This is the Soviet area. This was uh, basically the military situation in early '45, or <coughs> kind of in '45. This was the British. This was American, and they gave some authority to the French, who were not involved in the in the conference. Charles de Gaulle was a provisional leader in France and he was really PO of it and he wasn't really happy with it. But that's another story. Um, so that's where the, the, Rush, the, the, the Soviet army had ended up about this line, fighting all the way back from Moscow. They had suffered so much, it's unbelievable. Um, the percentages that I showed you are the casualties I got it from uh, uh, Wikipedia. The casualties, civilian and military together, in a percentage of the pre-war population. In, on your Wikipedia, you can find an impressive list. It's, it's disgusting to see all these numbers um, specified for each individual country. I just picked out a few. Germany, of course, was 
almost obliterated. They cause it, which is a fairly large percentage. UK less than 1%, US much less. USSR almost 14% of the population they lost. And this is one, one statistics, but statistic, but you can add other statistics. The infrastructure, the economy was completely down on the ground for the Soviets. In contrast, the US had a very strong economy at that time, a war economy. They had stayed, tried to stay away from the Second World War in Europe. They were attacked by Japan in 41. That's when they were forced into the war uh, in Pearl Harbor. Uh, they mostly fought in a Navy battle and a Marine battle on these islands in the Pacific. They were very reluctant to enter the, the scene in Europe, the, the stage in the war stage in Europe, until um, the invasion in the Normandy, in the, the, the landings there, and they played a key role, the US. I'm not diminishing it in any way. Um, history would have been quite different if they wouldn't have uh, uh, supported that, that, uh, ac that action. So, but the U.S. had a very strong economy because they had never fought on their own on their own territory. Everybody was working overtime, building ships, planes, guns, tanks, whatever you need in a, in a war situation. So that I want to emphasize that there was a the economic difference between the Soviet Union and the U.S. at that time was uh, couldn't be more extreme. Um, there was a strong mistrust. And the West had been allied with allies with Stalin. They had together fought the war. The U.S. had given uh, military aid to, to the Soviet Union during the war. But there was a really uh, building tension, and it basically that goes back a long way, and it is extremely difficult to explain it in a few minutes. Uh, but there was basically, oh, sorry. There was a, um, a stalemate, you can say. They came with different interests, different agendas, and... Basically, what happened is that that map became, from a military situation, became a political situation. So you yeah, need to be here, I think. So you had, um, this was Soviet-controlled, they agreed to that, Soviet-controlled part of uh, Germany, this became East Germany. This was uh, British-controlled, this was American-controlled, and this was French. So. These colors here, that was West Germany, became West Germany, and this was becoming East Germany. One thing they agreed on is that Germany would never have, should be able to ever start such a thing again. It was the second time that you had a world war triggered by the Germans. Um, a very peculiar situation is Berlin. That's the traditional capital of Germany, is uh, right here. You see in the colors that this is a miniature version of the big map. Berlin was based, it was not strategic at all, it was just political. The West demanded that they would have a foothold in, in Berlin. And Berlin was carved up in the same way as the whole country, in four sectors, British, American, French, and then on the east side and in in Soviet. And that became, when the Cold War started, East Berlin, the red part, and West Berlin, those other, other colors. I just mentioned that. And then uh, in August of that year, uh, the US used uh, two atomic bombs to attack Japan. Thank God it's the only time that the country has used nuclear weapons against civilians. It hasn't, fortunately, never happened since then. Um, this was a very important um, feature in the whole process. When I go into the, uh, the space race and the building of rockets, that's my next slide, uh, it was absolutely essential part of the military strategy that they had nuclear weapons, or at least the US had. On a positive note, in Yalta, the foundations were laid for the United Nations and Security Council. You're all familiar with that now, but that started around that time, gradually. These allies, they agreed that they would all take part as permanent members in, that, in these organizations. The Cold War started officially in 47. Um, you could say it started in 45. There's not really a distinct difference apart from one thing is that Truman, he was the new president of the United States. Roosevelt, he died just uh, two months after Yalta. He did never 
see the end of the war. He was a sickly person. Uh, I think he was a nice person, but he was uh, bad health. Uh, Truman uh, took over and he established the, what is later called the Truman Doctrine. It has to do with the a civil war in Greece. It, it's very complicated. I can't really uh, spend time on that, sadly. Um, but I encourage you, if you're interested, to uh, read up on those things. Um, because the lines now were drawn, political lines, the US now pumped a lot of money and, and resources into Western Europe to make that as strong as possible, as soon as possible, because it became a border with, between East and West. There was uh, martial help, we called it. I can remember it very well. When I grew up as a kid in the Netherlands, everything American was absolutely fantastic. American, they were the heroes. It was really, really a strong sentiment. Thank you very much. It was fantastic what you've done and what you're doing. I remember at the party at school, I saw the, my first Coca-Cola bottle. I've never seen anything like that. The, the beer shape and this brown prickly fluid. <laughs> I had no idea what it was. Um, yeah, when you're old, you have those memories. <laughs> um, the United States or the, the U.S. thought that they were, for at least some decade to come, the only one who had nuclear weapons. They were surprised when the Soviet Union uh, first de uh, detonated their first atomic bomb in a test in '49. It was four years after Yalta, and that it was a, I think, a very important. Um, build up to the, what I'm going to do next is how they developed rockets to go into space. If I may, I would like to give a, a, a small um, personal note in addition to the general uh, story. Um, I talked about, um, sorry, I need to be here. I talked about Berlin. There was a corridor between the border here. This was the Iron Curtain now. There was a, a, a checkpoint here at the Helmstedt corridor towards West Berlin because that, that was, of course, part of the... These buttons are too close. Um, did I lose my map? There was a corridor connection and also an air corridor for supplies to West Berlin. There have been later problems with the blockade and all these things. It was a tricky, very tricky situation. But in 1961, which is the year that Gagarin made his orbit, actually two weeks after that, I was in Berlin. Um, I was an architecture student, and they had had in 57 they had had a exhibition in West Berlin of um, modern architecture. This was typically in and propaganda stunt. They poured a lot of money, especially the United States, poured a lot of money in that. There was one area in Berlin called Hansa Viertel um, where they built uh, modern architecture. They invited all famous architects in the world to build something there, a church or a residential block or a hall. Or there were various uh, uh, really interesting things. And if you study architecture, it never happens that in one location you have all the latest architecture just together. So this was an exciting venue for an excursion. We are on this, the roof of this building, which was really special. I think it's still there. The roof rests only on one point, to, uh, on two points, one on each side, two beams, and a very thin concrete um, uh, floor that was hanging between those beams. We were students, so we climbed up and we had a lot of fun and, and looked at it. But this was the reason that we went to Berlin. However, which is more interesting, on 1st of May 1961, we were in East Berlin. You could still do that in those days. The wall was built in August 61, so it was just before. 1st of May is Labor Day internationally. Here in New Zealand, we have a different idea. I don't know where that comes from, but everywhere, in, uh, certainly in the socialist, the social democratic, and in communist countries, Labor Day is the 1st of May. That's a big event in the year. This was in uh, East well, Berlin. That's when the, um, the, the 40-hour week or the 80-hour day became law in New Zealand. Was, was in, uh, and that was they called it Labor Day. I think it was in October. That's why it's okay. Anyway, these... Uh, 
uh, and still today in all these countries in the East, you have these, these parades and, and really big things, also military parades. These were East Berlin people. East Berlin was extremely poor, gray, dusty, dirty in comparison to West Berlin where they had poured a lot of money in rebuilding it. The difference could not be bigger and that was on purpose. Um, what I, I took two pictures, one this one and one a few seconds later because it's the same crowd. What I really regret is I didn't take pictures of the huge banners which were hanging there as Leibe der Genosse Gagarin, long live comrade Gagarin, because it was two, just two weeks after he had made his orbital flight. You will, in the documentary, you will see that the public in Moscow, for instance, is really ecstatic when they hear for the first time that they have a cosmonaut in space. These people are not really ecstatic by the look of it. But um, the banners and the, 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 the emphasis on that event was still, was definitely there in East, uh, in East Berlin. Okay, that was a slightly personal excursion. Literally excursion. Let's talk uh, rockets. This started, um, of course, with the V2, which the Nazis had developed. Uh, you all know uh, Werner von Braun. He was a Nazi. He was the leader of the development of uh, the V2 rocket. Um, it was a fantastic accomplishment if you only think about the technology in that time. They started in 42 with the first launch. They also had to make the whole launch system mobile because they knew if they would have a permanent launch facility that would be bombed straight away. So they had to be secretly going somewhere, build it up as soon as possible, or fire the thing and then get the hell out of there. Um, in 45, immediately after the war, the US had Operation Paperclip, they called it. <laughs> no idea where that comes from. But they traced the, the, the scientists and the technicians who were involved in this technology and grabbed them and brought them to the United States. Uh, Werner von Braun was the most uh, famous one and became the most famous one, but there was a whole staff also, other technologies. Uh, Hitler was developing actually a bacteriological weapon. Uh, he had a rocket plane in development. So they found it all interesting that they found all that stuff. So they grabbed these people and, and the material and they brought it to the US. The Soviets did exactly the same in East Berlin. Uh, rockets had been developed by um, Werner von Braun and, and, and his uh, colleagues in a place called Peenemünde, which is in the far north of Germany, and it was now East Germany. So the Soviets had the control there, and they found everything what they wanted, and, or they took everything what they wanted, including the people, to develop rockets. So you have this, it's almost like, uh, um, uh, how do you call it in tectonics? The, uh, but I can't find the word. In the mid-ocean ridge, you have spreading of a sea, sea floor spreading. It's, it, you have some source, and then it spreads evenly in the in directions. It's, it's a funny metaphor, but the, the, the technology that the Nazis had developed, which was really advanced for the time, that was taken to two different locations and opposing locations, and that was the start of rocket development. The second thing which you need to know is that there was only one reason why they were desperate to get ballistic rockets. That is to de deploy nuclear warheads to the other side. That definitely was the only motivation. And it was a very strong one. The US thought that they were the only ones, and for a time they were, who had atomic bombs. Russia came fairly close, uh, the 49, I just showed it. And um, both wanted the ballistic rockets to deliver these warheads at long distance. A plane, which was the classical way to deliver bombs, was far too slow and, and at that long distance. The Russians had a disadvantage because it was far from Russia to the United States. But as soon as the United States had those ICBMs, as they were called, intercontinental, intercontinental mm, ballistic ICBMs, ballistic missile, they put them in West Germany, of course. So that was a relatively short way. Anyway, um, this definitely was the start of the rocket uh, development. Rockets had been built a long time before, before the war, many, many countries. 
but it was like amateuristic, kind of fun. There was never a national military program to build rockets until this. So this is really an historic uh, development in, in that context. So the development started on those sides as fast as possible. What reasons did the two parties have to go into space? Now, the ballistic missile we talked about, that was priority number one. Orbits, of course, it was obvious to think about if you have a, 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 what, what was going to be a spy satellite in orbit, you can watch your enemy. It's fantastic. If you can make it to orbit, definitely do that. There was a discussion with an American president. I don't recall who it was, Eisenhower or so. He talked about the, uh, you had air, national airspace that was well organized legally and internationally. Uh, you have your airspace. If an adversary flies in, you can shoot them down. They seriously thought about extending that into space. That, of course, doesn't make any sense <clears throat> because a satellite goes around the Earth. You cannot have a satellite that only goes over the Soviet Union or the United States. So, only as it's a geostationary satellite, but they didn't have that uh, capability. So, orbital access was a military incentive, absolutely. Um, Manned space flight, you can argue, but I think that was part of the same, same story. Both came fairly early with that idea um, to, to get people up there. The science, you can say, is related. Um, we, need, we knew very little about the upper atmosphere. We knew even less about conditions in space, especially for living creatures. Uh, Spice, as I mentioned, you will see that uh, Glenn and also uh, Yuri were talking about the cloud formations that they, they could see on their first flight. And it was immediately apparent that it would be fantastic for weather, for meteorology, for, a, I think, a military purpose, Navy and Air Force. There was one positive thing at that time, the International Geophysical Year. This was a science initiative, nothing to do with politics. From both sides, the scientists came together and they worked on geophysical problems. It was a, it really, there was a lot of spin-off in different programs after that one year. An Antarctic program, for instance, started uh, as a consequence. And they also um, discussed the use of space for that. So this, in my view, is the first positive development in that whole sequence if you separate military incentives from the scientific ones. Uh, one slide more about the space race, just the, the highlights. Uh, you will see that, oh well, no, this, uh, the, first or, the first satellite, Sputnik, was launched in 57. I was at high school. I remember that on, in the radio broadcast, they broadcast that the, the, the Radio amateurs could pick up that signal. That was the only thing that the satellite did, was sending a signal, a radio signal. But it was, uh, the next day, my math teacher gave us a lecture about orbits. And um, he was a really nice guy. He really did his best. I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. <laughs> this was so outlandish that you can have something continuously going without any motor or any engine or any uh, energy applied to it. Totally, we didn't even have the word satellite, it didn't exist. In my language, we call it artificial moon. It was the only term. Um, interestingly enough, one month later, the same configuration, they sent this dog up, um, Laika. I remember that very well. In Western Europe, we were really sorry for that dog because he would never come back alive. They didn't have a return configuration. But he actually suffered a lot because there was a temperature control problem. He basically overheated early in the, in the mission. He was a street dog from Moscow. <laughs> they trained him. I have a link here. I encourage you to look at the animals in space. It's on Wikipedia. Uh, you can find a huge list. I, had, I knew of some animal experiments because they needed to know how organisms would uh, respond to, let's say, um, long-term weightlessness, uh, radiation, you name it, all these things. But there was absolutely no idea, so it was obvious that uh, there were animal testing, but it, I had never an idea that there were so many, complete zoo, really, over decades, were launched into space. Did you know that, know that there had been toy toises? 
going around the moon and came back alive. The, the Russians said that. <laughs> it's one of those, uh, and fire, and uh, what is it? Uh, those flies that you can breathe very f rapidly. Fruit flies? Fruit flies, yeah. And, and rabbits and cats and, and <laughs> you name it. I mean, anything. This is, I, I can't go into this. I'm already taking far too much time. But, um, this is really an interesting point, but it emphasizes that we knew nothing about uh, how uh, the animals, but let alone humans, would respond in space. You will hear John Glenn say that before he went up, one of the doctors told him that he might have problems with focusing his eyes because of weightlessness. They had no idea. Um, the US tried the same, the same year. Uh, this was a public relations disaster because it was totally, totally in, in public. It came one and a half meters away from the pad and then fell back and exploded, <laughs> destroyed the whole one pad. <laughs> uh, in their own press, they had these expressions. <laughs> Kaputnik. <laughs> it was really sad <laughs> in, the, in the context of that race because they knew that they were not the first. In spite of the economic the difference between the Soviet Union originally and the US, the Soviet Union were beating them. Uh, just a couple, one month, a couple of months later, they uh, launched Explorer 1. That was the first US satellite in, uh, in orbit. I put this in because the uh, United States realized that they needed to be better organized in, in terms of organizations and, and um, yeah, organizations. They founded the ARPA, which became DARPA, which is still existing. That's the organization that was purely doing military research for space. Uh, well funded from the military budget, of course. And October 58, NASA was formed. Then we started to become serious about men's place, space flight. That in the US it was called Project Mercury. Um, the Mercury 7 were announced, those guys here. John Glenn was one of them. Um, so that they made that clear that they had that intention. The Soviets didn't talk very much about what they were doing. But then on the 12th of April, Yuri Gagarin made his first orbital flight, and that's what the first documentary is about. Um, I added this, but I think it, it's, it's really uh, special to know that a year earlier, less than a year earlier, there was a Sputnik 5 mission. There are two dogs and a lot of other animals, but those two dogs, they were doing exactly the same flight as Yuri Gagarin was going to do a year later. And they came back alive, of the lot of them. So these were the first animals who uh, were in orbit and came back. Uh, Laika, this dog, went into orbit, but he would never come back. They knew that because there was no return system. And then uh, the US uh, was beaten, of course, again, but they made two suborbital <laughs> flights. Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom. This is Grissom. Shepard is, I think, this guy. And then John Glenn went up in February '62, so that was uh, t ten months or so later. And that is the uh, the second documentary that we will have. Then was the famous speech by Kennedy to go to the moon. Before this decade is out, we will send a man to the moon and bring him back alive. You know, it's a very famous. Uh, Obama did a, a similar one, didn't he, just before he stayed the end too, didn't he? But Sorry? Obama, Obama, Obama did a similar speech. Oh, yeah, they, they copied us. They Many, several people <laughs> copied us, yeah. Let's do the, the documentaries now, and then I'll come back with the uh, starting up the discussion. Um, how do I get out of here?